Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not quite sure if the sound system is working, but I hope you can hear. We are delighted to see all of you today. I'm amazed to see you, very pleased to see the entire amphitheatre full. And a big, big welcome from us, the Cambridge Star of Paris, to all of you, and in particular the Institut Pasteur. Now, as it happens, you are here today on a totally historic occasion. This is the very first of the Cambridge Cutting Edge Lectures. What are the Cambridge Cutting Edge Lectures? They are a series of lectures which are being organized by the Cambridge Society of Paris, which is one of the largest groupings of uh, Cambridge alumni outside the UK. Each one is going to be done in partnership with an institution such as the Institut Pasteur, which is wonderful today, thank you. And each will be about cutting edge scientific topics. The origin of this was in fact a lunch with Moise Dreif, who may be in the audience somewhere. He's waving at me, very good. During which we were talking about various events being put on by the Cambridge Society and remarked that nothing, either by the Cambridge Society or indeed by most of the other equivalent organisations in Paris, ever touch on science. So we said, well, this must change. And hence the idea of the Cambridge Cutting Edge Lectures, and today is the very first of them for which we are hugely privileged to have Venki Ramakrishnan as the speaker. Now, <clears throat> Venki is uh, one of the world's leading biophysicists, biochemists. Uh, he was born in India. His family is scientific. His father was a, a, a biophysicist. His mother studied psychology at McGill University. And indeed, his sister is a professor at Cambridge. Venki graduated in India and then moved on to Ohio University in America. There he's studying, in fact, as a, as a physicist. After two years, he decided his course should be uh, biology, and he changed to become a, a <coughs> biochemist and commenced studying at uh, California University in America. He commenced his work on ribosomes at Yale University and then continued that at Utah and at Brookhaven. From there, he moved in 1999 to the mecca of science, Cambridge University, <laughs> where he became a group leader in the Medical Research Center uh, on the medical bio campus at Cambridge. Venki has won every conceivable kind of award. In reading his biography on Wikipedia or wherever, there is masses, masses, masses. Just picking out those three things, first of all, he was awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, in, and then he was knighted in 2012, and became president of the Royal Society in 2015. With all these huge accolades, I'm happy to say and amused to say that there's also a very human story that goes with it all. I was intrigued to read in his book, The Gene Machine, Venki said, as I began my thesis work, I realized that I could not see how to identify key questions, let alone how to approach them. Even worse, I didn't find my work at all interesting, so I retreated into my social life. Things changed suddenly when I met Vera Rosemary. Marriage focused my mind on my career. So, as I say, a very human side, and that continues. When he received the telephone call from Sweden for the great accolade, he said, we have quite a few pranksters in the laboratory. I presume that this was one of them. I even congratulated on him on how very well he was imitating a Swedish accent. <laughs> and then his wife, when it was announced to her, said, I thought you had to be really right to have one of those. <laughs> now, Venki's going to tell us obviously about his scientific work and also the path to where he has arrived now. That is encapsulated in, the, in his book, The Gene Machine, and a review of the book says, anyone who wants to know how modern science really works should read The Gene Machine. It is all here, the ambition, 
the jealousy, the factionalism, as well as the heroic late nights, the crippling anxiety, and the disastrous mistakes. We're going to hear much more about this and what it led to. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, so when the Cambridge Society of Paris invited me to give the first lecture in this series, I considered it a real honor. And I prepared a public lecture without realizing that it was going to be held at the Institut Pasteur. And uh, so for much of the audience, everything I say will sound very uh, elementary and trivial. Uh, but I ho so you won't get any information from the science part of what I'm going to say, but what I hope you'll get is some entertainment. Okay, <laughs> so, um, so, so let me start off uh, with, with this book. So the book has four themes. It was slightly motivated by the double helix, and luckily Richard Dawkins, who re reviewed the book, said you can think of Venki Ramakrishnan as a nice Jim Watson. I'm very glad he added the word nice, <laughs> because what I've tried is to capture the honesty of the double helix, but without the sort of gratuitous insults. Okay, So um, there are four themes. One is, um, I mean, the main character is the ribosome, which is the amazingly complex ancient machine that reads the code of life you know, to make proteins that make all uh, living organisms. A second theme is what it was like as an outsider. I, I was born and grew up in India. I moved at the age of 19 to the US to go to graduate school in physics and then changed. But initially I didn't go to very good schools. I didn't go to Harvard or Berkeley or Cambridge or any of those places. And what it was like as an outsider to slowly make my way up in the uh, world of science. And then, you know, when other outsiders talk about, read about science. Scientists are terrible revisionists, you know, of history. You know, in hindsight, it was all very beautiful. It was logical. Everybody was friends. We all got along in this noble quest for the truth. But science seldom works like that. You know, it's very human and it's very messy. People have personalities, they have ambitions, they have egos, they have rivalries. There's competition versus collaboration. I talk about prizes and the effect that prizes have on science. And uh, then, uh, although it's too late for me, uh, I, I, when I look back, I ask, you know, what are some lessons that I, you know, that one could learn from uh, my career? So to get back to the science itself, uh, you know, we have, if you ask somebody, uh, say, from the Cambridge uh, Society of Paris, uh, what a gene is, they, th they think they know what a gene is. They think it's something that we inherit, it gives us our traits and defines sort of who we are in some, uh, you know, intangible way. But if you probe them more carefully, they don't actually know what a gene is, okay? They just know it's some unit of heredity. And uh, they might know that it resides on DNA, but, but that's about it. Once you go beyond that, uh, most of them uh, won't know that. And the fact is, you know, we have thousands of genes, and this is an overestimate. This is from 2001. We now actually only have about 20 or 25,000 genes, although you can have alternative variants. So, in fact, you can make many more uh, products. Uh, but, but here's the interesting thing. You know, if you look at a weed, uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, it has 25,000 genes. If you have a worm, it has 20,000 genes. So it should give us some humility. We don't have a lot more genes than a worm or a, a, or a weed. And uh, this has to do with the fact that nature is not concerned about intelligence. You know, we think we're at the top of the pyramid because we're intelligent. Nature doesn't care about intelligence. It only cares about survival. And uh, so that's one thing. So anyway, if you ask what these genes are, genes are essentially uh, units of information f uh, for making proteins. And so then you might ask, what are proteins and why are they important? Well, proteins are long uh, polymers. So, so they're long chains uh, built up of units called amino acids. And these amino acids can have different shapes 
as well as different chemical properties. Some are positively charged, some are negative, some are neutral, some are not polar, apolar, etc. And you can represent them as this sort of string of letters uh, of beads on a string, if you like, each with a different letter, uh, because you, there are 20 of these amino acids, and you can, uh, you know, represent each of them by letter. Now the point is that the each protein has a unique order of these letters and a unique length. And that alone gives that protein its properties. Now what happens is when this chain is made, it, it folds up either spontaneously or with a little help from other uh, things in the cell. It folds up into its unique shape. Now to the outsider, you know, or even to all of us, we forget that this is actually almost miraculous. I mean, it's chemistry, not a miracle, but it is, you know, seems miraculous. It would be like taking a s strips of paper and writing down a different sentence on each strip of paper. And depending on what sentence you wrote, that strip of paper would spontaneously fold up into a completely different shape. That is how amazing it is. And it's, it's all done because of chemistry, but that's, that's the, 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 the amazing thing. And so, uh, these proteins, depending on the order of amino acids and their length, will fold up into completely different shapes. For example, this is collagen, which is a, a three-stranded helix, and uh, it's the protein that makes up our skin and cartilage and connective tissue. Actually, by mass, it's the most abundant protein in the human body. And this is hemoglobin, which uh, is a protein that carries oxygen uh, from our lungs through our blood to the tissues and muscles where uh, the oxygen is needed. And this protein is rhodopsin, which is a protein which sits in the uh, membrane of uh, cells in our retina, in our eyes, and it's a, an exquisite light detector. And so uh, when, uh, we, we, uh, when light hits our retina, it's detected by rhodopsin, and then that gets converted to a signal that eventually gets transmitted uh, through the optic nerve to the brain. And so without it, we wouldn't be able to see. So this is just to give you an example of three uh, completely different proteins, completely different functions and shapes. And remember, there are thousands and thousands of them, and each of those is made using information in a gene. So getting back to genes, uh, what are genes? Well, genes are basically sections of DNA which contain information. And then the information is on not only just what protein to make and what the protein is, but also when to make it, how to, you know, when to stop making it. There are all sorts of control uh, elements that go along with it. So all that information is encoded in a section of DNA. Now, if you look at DNA, this is, of course, that famous picture from 1953. Um, this is, uh, DNA is a double helix, and unlike proteins which contain 20 types of building blocks, there are only four types of building blocks that make up DNA. And the interesting thing is that each of those building blocks, called a base, will only pair with one of the other four, one of the four bases, so it has a particular partner. So, for example, A will pair with a T, and C will G will pair with a C, and vice versa. So what this meant was, and that was clear right from the very first paper, was that if you knew the order of bases on one strand, it had the information for how to make the other strand. So when this structure came out, the amazing thing was that you, it immediately showed how you could get two copies of it from one copy. In other words, if you were able to separate the two strands, each strand had the information to make the other strand, so you'd end up with two copies. And that's how genetic information can be replicated, can be propagated, and so on. And it solved a centuries-old mystery of how you know, cell information in a cell can, can be carried over when the cell divides. But what was not clear from that structure and took about uh, the next 15 years to solve was how does this molecule contain uh, information on how to make a protein, okay? And the puzzle was this. Well, the first thing was that this is DNA, it's a double helix, and it turns out it's actually copied into a, a temporary molecule called 
messenger RNA because it carries the genetic message from the nucleus of the cell up to the cytoplasm outside where the proteins are made. Now, th that too was a, an interesting discovery which actually has links to Pasteur because, you know, Sidney Brenner was talking to Monod and, uh, and, uh, and, and Jacob about this and together they published this, this uh, paper shortly after the uh, whole operon uh, hypothesis. So if you, um, now for the, for the layperson, the way to think of messenger RNA is, you know, the British Library in London has a collection of every book published uh, in Britain. Now, if you go to the British Library, they're not going to let you go read, take out a book and read it, okay, because it's just too valuable. What they'll do is, in the old days, they'd give you a microfilm or a, you know, a copy of the book. Now, nowadays, they'll give you a scan, a digital scan of the book, and you can read the scan. So you can think of DNA as a collection of all the books. In other words, the information on all of the knowledge on how to build another cell, okay, or how to build the pro you know, all the proteins that make up the cell. And you can think of RNA as a working copy. So it's, it's a copy of one of the books in that library of information. But it still doesn't explain how you can go from this sequence, this sentence written in a four-letter alphabet, uh, to something like a protein which is written in a 20-letter alphabet, which has 20 types of building blocks. And uh, if you were to say that each base specifies an amino acid, you would only be able to code for four amino acids. If you were, even if you were able to read them two at a time, you'd still only code four times four, so, which is not enough. So very quickly it was realized, and then shortly afterwards it was proved that the code is read three at a time, and uh, it's a non-overlapping code. So if you, if you read three, then the next three don't overlap with the first three. And so those units of, of three bases are called codons because they, each of those specifies a particular amino acid. Shortly after that, uh, Francis Crick realized that there must be some sort of adapter molecule because these amino acids by themselves don't seem to recognize DNA or RNA in a particular manner. And so he proposed there'd be an adapter molecule that would at one end bring along a, an amino acid and at the other end have three bases that would pair with the three bases on the codon just like the bases pair across the DNA helix. And that turned out to be correct. That molecule was called tRNA and it was discovered in uh, Boston by Zemechnik and Hoagland uh, a, f a few years, actually only a f two or three years later. And uh, by the way, Crick's adapter hypothesis was never published in a journal. It was published in these letters that the uh, RNA club, RNA tie club, would circulate among its members. So, you know, it was sort of this, so, so almost like a secret society, you know, and they, they all knew what was sort of going on. Uh, and so anyway, you'd have another tRNA that would generate, a, a look at another codon and bring along its amino acid and so on. Now, this is, seems like a complicated process. And, not surprisingly, it doesn't ha just happen by itself. It turned out cell biologists were trying to understand if you had newly made proteins, where do they end up on the cell? And somewhat surprisingly, they found out that these newly made uh, amino acids, uh, newly made proteins, which they detected by radioactive <laughs> amino acids, weren't spread out all over the cell. Rather, they seemed to be concentrated in these blobs on, a, on an organelle called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And when these blobs were isolated, they, they turned out to be particles, which were all about the same size. They were about 300 angstroms in diameter. And if you look closely, each of them consisted of two uh, parts, a large part and a small part called the large and small subunits. Now, they were, when you purify cells, the fraction that they were isolated from was called the microsome, which are actually fra fragments of the endoplasmic reticulum. And when they were analyzed, they were, they, sh they were shown to be made of both RNA and protein. So they were called the ribonucleoprotein particles of the microsomal fraction. Okay? <laughs> now, imagine 
at a conference and every time you want to refer to the particle, you have to say this entire phrase. You know, it turned out to be a nuisance. So very quickly, Howard Dinses, uh, who's at Johns Hopkins, said, look, why don't we just call it the ribosome? And my mentor, Peter Moore, said, if a biochemist had discovered it, it would have been called polypeptide polymerase. But because a cell biologist discovered it, it's called something like a zome. And so it's, you know, it's called the ribosome. Okay.